I had one thing that I wanted to just read. It's one line. It's Rumi. And it says, anyone who has seen the beloved wonders where are all the others? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Wonderful. Wow. Where did you find Beautiful. that? That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Go ahead, Charles. All right. So you want me just to plunge in here? Sure. All right. Well, uh, welcome, everyone. And um, if you've been listening in, we've been having a chat here about all sorts of things, Russia and Nadine Tolstoy and everything else. So, uh, but we were also earlier talking about this photograph. So I think maybe I should just share with you that this beautiful photo of Baba and the reason it looks a little bit, um, you know, damaged and old. Uh, it was sent to my mother uh, in the 60s. I don't know which year now, by Mara. And uh, on the bottom, mother said it was Mara who wrote this. Um, on the bottom, it says, my beloved Baba. So I'm, I'll begin with Baba's words. Uh, uh, and this quote, which has always been one of my very favorites, but I had not thought of it in so long, but Wayne, my good friend, Wayne Myers, sweetly sent me this on my birthday, this quote with a car. And I thought, boy, this is just so perfect. So I thought I would share it with everybody this morning. Um, in the silence of your perfect surrender, my love for you, which is always silent, can flow to you to be yours, to keep and to share with those who seek me. Such a beautiful quote of Baba's. You know, when Ruthie uh, first asked, wrote and asked, you know, if I could share about Elizabeth. Charles, um, could, you, yes. could you read the quote again, please? Sure. Thank you. Sure. I can be like Francis, you know, uh, uh, Francis Prevzon, when he said 69, he gave a talk and, he's, and he said that Baba had him read out his poems to him three times. And he said, do you know why three times? And we said, no, this is 69 Darshan. He said, because he said he was memorizing them so that he could say them when he came again in 700 years. <laughs> So I, so I, I, I think of that. It's, it's good to have things read out more than once. In the silence of your perfect surrender, my love for you, which is always silent, can flow to you to be yours to keep and to share with those who seek me. <clears throat> so beautiful. So uh, when Ruthie asked me to speak about Baba, I mean, excuse me, Elizabeth, uh, during this time, you know, her birthday being two days from now on the 26th. Um, we always growing up would celebrate her birthday as a big bang because mine is just before and Wendy's is just after. So Elizabeth loved the idea that we would have this one big celebration and she called it the big bang. And, um, and so this is a very happy time of year in my memory because of the big bang. Uh, because birthdays were a lot of fun with 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 Elizabeth. She um, she loved birthdays, and you know she her habit was to give everybody a present on her birthday, <laughs> which I think is a very nice tradition. <laughs> and when we were children, it was especially nice tradition. <laughs> you know, it was her birthday, but we got presents, so it was wonderful. Anyway, so this time of year is the big bang time of year in my my history. And um, but so when when Ruthie asked me, of course, I'm always delighted to speak about Elizabeth. But then my first first thought was uh, what Elizabeth used to say when people would ask her to, you know, reminisce or to tell what happened back in the blue bus tours or or Nasik or something like that. And she would quite frequently she would sort of look at them and she'd say, yes, well, I think I've written about that somewhere. <laughs> and that would be that would be her answer. <laughs> you know, go read what I've written. 
<laughs> I'm not doing that to you today. If I were doing that to you today, I would I would read from the book my little memoir about Elizabeth, which uh, which I love to read from because it's all stories of being with her. But many of you uh, I think have read that or or know those stories. So I decided to do none of the above, not send you somewhere else and not read out my own memories of Elizabeth. I, I, I thought, let's hear from Elizabeth things that you have not heard. <coughs> um, uh, and that's um, letters. I'm gonna start with a poem she wrote, but also letters that she wrote to her parents, her father particularly, but both her parents, while she was with Baba in India. Very interesting how she describes her experience uh, of, of being with Baba to her parents. And there's a real meaning, there are many levels of meaning as to why that's significant in her life. Um, in any case, uh, let me start, however, with a poem. Um, Elizabeth, as you may or may not know, uh, loved poetry. And um, we love poetry, Christopher and I, so we're kindred spirits that way. Unfortunately, growing up with Elizabeth, in that period of her life, she was so busy with the center and all, and I was so young, I was not immersed in poetry then, I wish I was, had been, and she rarely mentioned it, but Later, after her passing, I came to realize, and, and when I got her library, of course, with all those poetry books, uh, I came to realize how poetry was very important in her life. And occasionally, when she would write something to mother in a card and quote a poem, it would be from memory. So she actually, she actually had a lot of poems in her mind. I just didn't know at that time to ask her. Uh, this book uh, is a journal-like book, and Wendy and Buzz very generously gave me this. This was how, where she would put her favorite poems, write them out over the years, mostly in her younger years, but some in her later, you know, later means uh, after she met Baba, but not, this is not when I knew her. This is from earlier in her life. Um, and so it's fascinating because it, it's, it's like an insight into the poetry she loved best. Uh, you know, so here's a Longfellow poem, right? Or Edgar Allan Poe and some of the, the women who were writing at that time, she particularly liked. And she, here's one from Amy Lowell. Here's one from, um, Emerson, you know, so things like that. So this was her poetry book. Um, very, there were some, there's some in here that are not indicated who wrote, which I think are hers. But then there are a couple that I know were hers because she put her initials under them. So I'm gonna share with you one that has ECP under it. So it's definitely hers. And this, I am thinking, she wrote just after she met Baba, uh, because I know she was using this book in the early 30s and probably that was it. I don't think she took this to India. I think this was, that stopped this particular uh, book. And at the end, the last poem in this, uh, I, the reason I know she was using it in the early 30s is because there's a manuscript in here that's not written out in the in the pages, but is contain a poem she wrote in 1932 in California. And that's probably the last time she used this book. So here's a poem she wrote very early and I think it was right after she met Baba. <clears throat> you came to me unsought because I thought only to find one such as you in dreams. You stole into my life when I was sad at heart, I woke to find you there. When I most needed love, you came and spread the warm glow throughout my life, through my life. I looked out 
and saw the world transformed, reflecting heaven. So it is that I love you through time and all eternity. That's so beautiful. Uh, to me, it just, it feels so much like her as well, that poem. Um, so, this is of course a later picture. And I don't know if Chris Barker is on this particular Zoom, but I know he has been before, but if he is, I owe him the, the kindness of this picture. He took it and shared it with, with us. And then I was able to use it in my little book about Elizabeth. <clears throat> it's one of my very favorites of hers because it captures both her wisdom and her wit. You know, she's almost, <laughs> almost smiling. So it's a little bit of both. Um, so as I say, I'm just going to share these letters and I hope that you will find them as interesting as I do. Um, and until I read these letters, uh, which Kitty actually had gathered together in a manuscript, Wendy and Buzz have all of Elizabeth's papers. We have Nadine's and Norina's, but they have Elizabeth. So, you know, there's many, many more things, but these Kitty gathered together for a um, little manuscript she was working on about the founding of the center. It was never published, but in doing that gathering together, she gathered together a lot of letters that Elizabeth had written to her mother and her father uh, while she was in India with Baba. And she wanted them to know what she was experiencing. You know, she was very close to her parents. And she was very much, from all reports, like her father, Simeon Chapin, very reticent, businesslike, stoic. Um, generous of heart, um, wise. Um, she often would quote her father. Um, her mother was more into, you know, she loved beautiful things. She loved decorating homes. You know, Yupon Dune, she decorated all in Art Deco, for example. And she had scrapbooks full of potential things to decorate a home with. She was, so that was more her personality. Um, Elizabeth was much more like her father, but she was close to both of her parents. Uh, so she wrote uh, to uh, her parents um, from India, trying to help them understand uh, what she was experiencing. How wonderful really it, it, it was and is that her parents supported her in this adventure, you know, and uh, they were Christians, grew up in that world, and her father was very religious um, and very committed to his church, and his foundation ended up being set up to help churches and libraries. That was his interest. And uh, I say that because, you know, going off to India with an Eastern master was probably a, uh, not an easy thing for them to kind of wrap up their minds around. Um, but, uh, but they loved Elizabeth very much. And they saw Elizabeth as I saw her, as many who met her saw her as something quite special quite different. She was, she was brilliant and, and wise and um, very competent person, you know, so, uh, so I suppose that helped them to, uh, to, to see that this must not be something just off the deep end, you know, she's, if, it, if it was what Elizabeth wanted. So here's, here's one of the excerpts from one of the letters. She writes to them, I am not here to vegetate in India. 
<laughs> Sounds so much like her. I'm not here to vegetate in India. I am here to grow. Spiritual life is a divine adventure. I personally do not aspire to ultimate heights. In fact, I am an ordinary human being without even great ambitions. But since meeting Baba, I have had an extraordinary experience beyond the ordinary run of life, and the lesser no longer satisfies me. One who has seen even but a glimpse of the beauty of the summit must keep on going somewhere towards it. You know, I, what a wonderful writer she was, you know? I mean, really, these are letters. Can you imagine? We don't do letters anymore, but I mean, she was a wonderful writer, really wonderful. I look forward to the day when you can see all of her correspondence because she, and you know, there were many articles in the Mayor Baba journals that, that you can see and mother published some of her writings and treasures of, from the Mayor Baba journals, which is a more recent book. So there are some places you can see her writing. A beautiful writer. <clears throat> so here's another excerpt from a letter. Baba has made it clear to us that all these things like fasting, prohibitions, or even meditations are not spiritual in themselves, but they are spiritual training. And as with everything else in life, we must have training. The importance of our training is what we are being trained for. And that Baba knows far better than we can know with our limited minds. There is therefore very considerable individuality in our training. Unlike teachers of ethics, the general co code of training has as many variations as there are individuals. For one to keep silent for one year might do more harm than to speak for one year. Therefore, rest assured that what Baba has chosen for my training is essential. This photograph, as I'm sure many of you know, is Elizabeth at Panchkani Cave, a place where Baba would go in seclusion. And Baba had Elizabeth spend one night in seclusion in Panchkani Cave, which is Tiger, Tiger Valley. And so this is the next morning Baba comes after she's been the one night uh, there in seclusion. And then here's Elizabeth in Happy Valley sitting with Baba in the tree. <clears throat> so here's something she wrote to her parents um, about suffering and joy in life. If it is true of the avatars lives that they suffered with humanity, it is also true that they entered into the joys of humanity as no one else could. It has been remarked about Baba by those who have seen him in all parts of the world that he makes those around him happy when one is with the master, material giving up or even penances are never privations. For bit by bit, almost imperceptibly, the things of the world are exchanged for the things of the spirit. And in this great exchange of life, a, a great exchange of life for spiritual life comes bliss and meaning of existence. Therefore, it is said that the spiritual path is easier to tread with a master. Joyousness is an attribute of God-realized souls, and its effulgence radiates to those around. Thorns are not eliminated, but the fragrance of the flower predominates. Isn't that beautiful? Thorns are not eliminated, but the fragrance of the flower predominates. You know, I, 
uh, that brings to mind the story of Elizabeth collecting beads. Wendy has her bead collection. She collected beads from all over the world. You know, she was an inveterate traveler and she would, wherever she went, she loved to go and find beads. I mean, you could say almost obsessive about collecting <laughs> beads. <laughs> and uh, when she met Baba at one point, and Christopher's, I, I hope will help me here. <laughs> I've forgotten what year it was, Christopher. But Baba, at one point when they're in their travels, Baba gave her a gift of some beads. And Elizabeth, which Wendy has, those beads that Baba gave to her. And she said, you know, she told Wendy after that, the whole wanting of, to collect beads went away. I never collected another bead in my life. What? You're looking for them, all right. Um, so we must have some too. Um, so that was the end of bead collection. So that this letter made me think of that because it's a small example. And it's like I mentioned earlier about the silver and the china and the, you know, things like that, that she said that was another life. Because after Baba, you know, she, she just never thought of all those things again. Things that, you know, were important to her and interesting to her. She loved beautiful things. But after Baba gives you the bead, there's no, no other bead, you know, there's no other bead. So here's an excerpt that she wrote. Yes. Yes. Well, you you I, you have to bring it up here because my screen uh, is the place to share. Christopher is the curator around here. I have no idea where anything is. I have to ask him where my own things are. Where are they? We can spotlight. Huh? So we'll spotlight you so we can see the beads better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but can people see my video of myself? Yes. Can see these things? Oh, okay. Oh, he has a picture. Oh. Beads. Beads given to Elizabeth by Mayor Bob in Kashmir, 1933. I was a great bead collector from various countries where I traveled. After Baba gave me these, my desire for collecting ceased. Beautiful. Thank you, sweetie. I'm glad you have a picture of that. I knew we didn't have the actual beads. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't see you. I don't see you, Charles. You don't so see, me? see the beads. No, I see Bob on the tree with Elizabeth. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know how to make Let's that see. happen. I'm trying see. to. Uh, so, we could maybe do a if double. Ruthie highlights okay. me. We could I just. Do a uh, Rose is looking on her telephone. It doesn't show as much. As oh, okay. All right. Well, yeah. I'm not looking on my telephone. Okay. Just I don't know. Not, you're, you're not missing anything except the beat. I like the speaker. I like so this damn. Go to view and look for side by side gallery, and you'll see Charles and everybody. Rosie wants to see the beads. <clears throat> Well, the beads have gone. <laughs> they, they've left the building. We, we can bring them back later. So I, uh, <coughs> anyway, uh, so here's one that an excerpt she wrote. Again, I mean, it's important that these are not just letters to anybody. These are for her father and her mother. Um, and that's why it's very particular and, and it's not, you know, she wasn't writing for the world here. She was just writing for her parents. 
So this one, this excerpt is, is about cares and worries. She says, cares and worries of mundane existence, the master never permits to rest, but momentarily on our shoulders. I might say Bob allows his disciples to suffer, but not to fret or worry or even be bored. Suffering is one of the means to spiritual awakening and inner perception, but worries of personal and everyday living only cloud the vision and impede the spiritual growth. I think that's a wonderful way to put it, that Baba, there's something different to talk about how Baba, through suffering, we come closer to Baba, through worry, we cloud our vision of Baba. Would which you mind reading it again, Charles? Yeah, which is why Bob emphasized don't worry so much. Cares and worries of mundane existence, the master never permits to rest but momentarily on our shoulders. I might say Baba allows his disciples to suffer, but not to fret or worry or even be bored. Suffering is one of the means to be to, to spiritual awakening and inner perception, but worries of personal and everyday living only cloud the vision and impede the spiritual growth. Now, I'm gonna read a little more from these letters, but just the context is her father, of course, I don't know about her mother as much uh, about her religiosity, but her father, as I mentioned, uh, was very religious and very active in his church and very philanthropic in religious circles to Christian churches particularly. Um, so of course, <clears throat> Elizabeth has this in mind. She grew up that way as well. When she writes to her father uh, about Baba, she is connecting it right, to his experience. So here's, here's one, one letter she writes about her training. <clears throat> Baba's training for his disciples is Christ's precept. Be ye in the world, but not of it. His example is so radiant and compelling that it is rare to find except in spiritual history of its great leaders. Baba trains us through his example. In my experience, I find that to be out of the world is easy. But this constant moving around, as we have done practically since I have come to India for the spiritual purposes of Baba's work is far less easy. In fact, if it were not for his example and inspiration, we could not have done it at all. But in this work for the spiritual upliftment of mankind, Baba makes himself available in many ways. No one or any circumstances can stand in the way of his work. And as followers, we must follow. No matter the hour, how tired one is, how hungry one may feel, no extraneous fact important to one's own ego shall impede the onward march. <laughs> of course, we would not want to impede, but human frailties are surely impediments in following a spiritual life. One can so easily give up the big things of the world, but it is the little things and the habits in us, in us which, and she quotes here, stick closer than a brother. I guess that's an expression of the day. We are constantly living in a cosmos of individuals who, except for Baba, might have nothing in common. And the ways of life are not only separated by West and East, but by custom, habit, race, and creed. Yet, when we see Baba's daily Baba's shining example of love thy neighbor as thyself, we are inspired to overcome the false egos which separate one from another and replace it with a more universal love for mankind than we had hitherto thought possible. 
It is practice, not theory. It cannot be the type of sentimental affection for one's fellow man, such as the old lady who rides in her limousine and takes gifts to the poor, feels only at Christmas time. <laughs> it is an every day, every hour, something which must be lived and not preached. The standard is hard to live up to, and most of us fail in regard to control of moods and disposition. Disciplined life such as we are now living helps one to keep their compass to the north. But if it were not for the incentive of Baba's own example, which is not merely good and invigorating, I for one would probably never have been drawn to the spiritual life. Circumstances of the next months to come may force many to think on spiritual matters who have never thought before and quicken the impulse of those who previously had spiritual inclinations. And it will give them every opportunity to apply them to the fullest extent. But the spiritual life to be lasting is essentially voluntary. Otherwise, when the restraints are lifted, one gravitates back to the easy way of life. Yet, with all the goodwill in the world and the voluntary spirit, one cannot become truly spiritual quickly. For myself, I am just a moth that has seen a great light and struggles around it. But no one can gainsay that I have not seen the light. It is still a long way off and only through the grace of God can one ever become the light. And then she talk, turns to her father directly. You, father, have lived a life, probably the nearest to anyone I know regarding the precept, be ye in the world, but not of it. For you were never a Sunday Christian. For you applied to weekday life in all of its phases, the religious spirit. Most people say it cannot be done in Wall Street, but quietly and surely you have accomplished in the material world what many others, including ministers, cannot keep up during the six other days of the week. Yet I hope I do not detract one bit from this statement, which I truly believe and have witnessed for so many years and certainly admire, that with it I, your daughter, was never inspired to become religious. It did not, however, make me feel the opposite as children of Puritan parents are said to react, but rather I took it all as a matter of fact. Now, how to apply the ox and the ass of biblical times to the present daily subway experience? The nearest I came to spiritual experience was when one young Northfield and then I wanted to translate into practical service, such as joining Dr. Greenfell's mission in Labrador. But what did I do about these inspired moments? Well, practically nothing. In fact, I do not even think I even mentioned them as I was caught up in the mode of average life in the city with all its material tendencies and occupations. Perhaps I can say, I inherited the aptitude to spiritual things, though they were unmanifest until I received the awakening impulse from Baba to do something about it, not merely thinking of doing it. Don't think I am always going to be in India. Although my preliminary training is here, it is not study, it is training in the school of life and not such an easy school at that. There are no vacations when hourly one is not tested. Fortunately with Baba, every failure, every failure is turned to constructive good and one's efforts renewed. Also in this community life one leads, everyone's failures or shortcomings are yours as well. 
and happily everyone's success or step forward is your own. Underlying everything and life itself is an undertone of joy engendered through Baba. No heavy somberness or misty mysticism or pious sanctimony. These shadows are quickly dispelled if a disciple has these inclinations. Baba sees life as a whole and is able to impart a clear vision to others. God becomes something truly to be desired. I love that. That's perhaps one of my favorite lines from Elizabeth. God becomes something, something truly to be desired. These are so beautiful, Charles. Thank you for bringing me. Amazing, amazing letters. <clears throat> um, now, as you know, I'm sure many of you know this history. So the time did come after more or less five years in India with Baba, you know, the Nasik Ashram. I mean, Elizabeth traveled a little, uh, you know, for Baba's work. Uh, she was away for short periods, but basically the Nasik Ashram 37, and then the uh, living on the hill 38, 39, going on the blue bus tours. I think she was on <clears throat> four of them and drove the bus. So you know this, the history that as she describes, <laughs> She, she, I, she was the master of understatement. I mean, it was a very rigorous life, very difficult life, all crammed into that little bus, going into these out of the way places, you know, very difficult to eat or to, you know, to sleep. I mean, it was a very rigorous life. Um, not that he, living on the hill was a bed of roses. I mean, it was not easy life up there either. So anyway, all of that. And then 1941, spring of 1941, which just seems to be a pivotal year with Baba. Um, Baba calls her and Norina and Nadine and says, I want you to go to back to the United States and spread my message of love, working together collaboratively. And so there becomes the transition he didn't say, a typical of Baba, of course, he didn't say for how long. He, you know, he sort of indicated, well, maybe you'll be back in a year or, you know, six months or, you know, but knowing Baba, you know, you, one never knew. And, um, and, I, and I guess for Norina and Elizabeth, it was not until 1947 when they returned to India that they saw Baba again. And then uh, of course, Nadine never never did see Baba again in, in physical form um, after they left in 1941. So she writes to her parents um, just before leaving India. And of course, a world war is raging at that time. What can I do this time in this time of uncertainty the world over? I can but seek the one certainty which every religion has taught since the antiquity of man, and that is our divine creator. I do not do this through fear of the future, uncertainty of the present, but rather through a deep inner urge. There has never been a period of decision in my life. Rather, I couldn't do otherwise. I am like that, even in the smaller things in life, going into business when it was uncharted field for women, going to, into the Arctic when it was uncharted even for men. Usually our feeling of being the reverse of happy is because we are short-sighted. Take the condition of the world today. Everything looks dark and seems to be getting darker. Although the world is constantly changing, people seem to be afraid of change. 
And yet the Bible says, the old order changes, giving place to the new. Baba has told us that everything happening in the world today is necessary for the spiritual outcome of man. He has said that in six months time, there would be such changes that one could not even think back to the former status quo, that even the physical face of the world would change in the time ahead. But this is all material. Spiritual rebirth is taking place, and man for the next 800 years may be said to come into his spiritual heritage. So in this, we can all be thankful and call it a happy new year, which turns the corner from the height of materialism to the path of spirituality. The strange interlude now taking place will in time be understood. Every great phase of the world has had its cataclysm. For example, the first six days of creation and the world and throughout ancient times. So why should modern times not have its share in the universal drama? So this um, next letter, <clears throat> we skip ahead to 1944. And I hope I'm not taking too much of your time with this, but am I okay? All right. If you're enjoying it, we'll go forward. Uh, I guess you can choose. <laughs> you it's don't great. Have it's just great. You don't <laughs> have to. <laughs> Zoom is great that way. Uh, so uh, there you go. Uh, yeah. which dog is that do you know the name of that dog oh uh that's chum with kippy isn't that chum christopher no it's not chum. no it's not chum it's um canute i'm sorry oh, it's canute uh, canute thank with kippy thank yeah. you okay i'm glad christopher's here i would not remember anything <laughs> i do remember kippy <laughs> i have that much uh, right um Uh, so we're going to skip ahead to 1944, June 1944, um, because, of course, Elizabeth, uh, her charge from Baba, she and Norena, was to find a place, a center. And, um, and you know that story, how they tried to go different places and, you know, uh, test out this and test out that. And turns out it was in in their backyard, <laughs> but Baba sent them all these places in the meantime to to look. And so she writes to Baba in June fourth, nineteen forty four, and this is a very important letter because it's the transition from the property being her father's and hers to being Baba's. And she says, and you know, Baba's traveling. So it's very difficult to get letters to Baba. He's on the must tours and so forth. So she, when you do write, when one did write at that time, one wrote at length, if it was something important, a business thing, you know, couldn't, you just couldn't write letters frequently if, if you follow. He starts out, Baba dear, you have received a number of cables about from me about the property in South Carolina, which I hope you will accept as one of your spiritual centers in the United States. When I first cabled, the land had been promised to me by father, but as it belonged to a company of which he is part owner called Myrtle Beach Farms Company, it took considerable time to be made available. I remember your having mentioned Myrtle Beach many times when we were in India and the possible stay of the group here, should you go to the USA. And Arena and I plan to go down just when your timely letter came from Margaret, which you will remember again, which you will remember again mentioning Myrtle Beach. I cannot help but feel that you were in the back of it all, helping matters spiritually, because so many circumstances came to the situation to facilitate the dividing up of the 1,800 acres now, 
which could never have been worked out so easily if fa father had passed on due to the complications of his partnership interest and the different heirs of his estate later. However, it came out surprisingly better than anyone could anticipate. It is what my one desire to give the property to you forever for your spiritual cause. How best to do it can be decided when you come. Father giving me the property involves his paying a gift tax, which I would have to pay all in the same year. As I see it, the best is to have it in my name and I pay the land taxes, etc., until you come and decide how it can be best, most suitably done according to your purposes. In the meantime, I will leave it to you in a will for safety. You may be sure it will be given from the heart. That was Baba's order. Also, I am pleased to say that Father gave it to me from the heart and knows the fact that it will be used for your spiritual and humanitarian purposes eventually. It would be the dream of my life for you to have a great center here. I can only hope you find it useful for your universal cause. No name other than the center for Meher Baba will be given it until you decide that too. The first thing Norina and I did last February was to have two water wells dug and found water 15 feet and down in one place and 21 feet in another. Also, we found springs on the property. So you may be sure there's plenty of water. Then as soon as father definitely promised me the land, we ordered a two room house, the cabin on the hill. That's in parentheses, that was later name, with screened in porch, which we call your hut. For the first week, we have not left the property as we want to initiate it for you in constant thought. We find a vast amount of work will have to be done in clearing the underbrush, clearing an underbrush because the virgin land, with virgin land, there are so many insects and crawling things like the first day of creation. <laughs> but then they were not said to bite. <laughs> also, there were, there are alligators of large size in the lakes, not crocodiles. And this long lake is said to be fishermen's paradise. We will only bathe in the ocean, which is about perfect and not annoy the alligators. We will have to see about a road being built down to the ocean. Although one could row across the lake and then easily go over to the ocean if one had a boat. In fact, it is suggested that a bridge be built across a narrow section of the long lake for easy access. But this we would not do until you came. Therefore, a small road down to the ocean is best for now. After the war, there are all kinds of possibilities for building and for having electric light and telephone installed as this convenience passes along the main highway which crosses our property. But at present, wires cannot be installed due to restrictions. So we use lanterns like at Meherabad. Fortunately, we can still use cars to go and come, but with a small quota of rationed petrol. Mail, however, and milk are delivered if we put a box out on the main highway and buses run by, but we do not yet know the schedule. I mentioned this to show you the property is not inaccessible, although so secluded. It has great possibilities for development. Please write and let me know what you want, what you want us to do foremost and your general idea about it all. Kindly tell me that you, that you will, it will make you happy, that you will make me happy by accepting as soon as you come. In every, in every thought and deed, it is yours now. I have consulted with Norina and others and they agree that it is more practical and workable for me to keep the title until you come, but leave it to you in a will meantime. Meanwhile, with all my love to you and my loving remembrances to all, devotedly yours, Elizabeth. 
So that's a sort of an early snapshot of their experience of the center. And it's true, as they looked back, they realized that Baba had actually planted the seed about Myrtle Beach, mentioning it very often. And it just it really didn't occur that it would be possible. First of all, who knew that there was that land there and those lakes? I mean, that was unexplored for them. You know, it was all just, there was no, there were no roads into that area. So they weren't really picturing it, you know. And also it belonged to a company. It belonged to his, the you know, Simeon Chapin and the, and the Burroughs family. But the interesting footnote to this letter is that soon after, and I'm not going to from memory get all the dates right, but soon after, it was in 1944 that he, Simeon Chapin formally gave the property to Elizabeth. And then, of course, she eventually transfers it to Baba, as she explains in the letter. But I think it's 1945, he dies. So think of that, right? The timing. As she says, if he had died before giving the property to her, this could not have happened. So the timing is very interesting. And there are other letters, which I am not quoting today, where she writes to her father urgently in the early, you know, the, and the, when she decides this must be it, um, you know, Easter Sunday, and she goes and she and Arena and they see it and they have this experience, this must be it. She begins writing urgently to her father to hurry up, make a decision explaining why this is the perfect place for Baba's work and humanitarian work and that it will be a fulfillment of his vision for philanthropy, for service. And, but she says, but father, you must do it now. You must not hesitate, you must not wait. And somehow she knew the urgency and, uh, and it happened just in time. It happened just in time. Another beautiful snapshot of her in, in India. And a picture I believe she took of Baba during this period that she was there. And as you know, she cared for the animals while there, um, Baba's animals. This is Lily the gazelle that she's feeding. Here they are dressed in saris. Elizabeth, uh, as you're looking at Baba, she would be on the right next to Margaret and between Margaret and Kitty. Baba in the tree. Here's a shot of Baba wearing Elizabeth's coat. Now this is the coat that is buried at the center. I think you all know that. That Baba, the, at first the plan was for Elizabeth to be, her ashes to be interred at the center. But then she asked Baba if, if instead they could be interred on Meherabad Hill, you know, near the Samadhi where Narina and Nadine and Kippy, you know, are all there. And um, Baba agreed, but said, but you must bury something that you treasure uh, at the center instead, right? And so that's, she chose the coat that Baba wore, her coat that Baba had worn uh, while in India. <clears throat> and so that's what is buried there um, between Del Ruba and, and uh, you've all seen the plaque between Del Ruba and uh, Baba's house. What else were we seeing in that photo, Charles? I'm trying to kind of get a picture of the scene, of the cement, the lay of the land. What, what is that? What is else are we looking at? It's in, it's in Benares. Is that a person on a camel down? 
just below Baba's hands there on the I, I don't the I don't where I don't the light is all I don't see a camel but um this was this was during this is just a person but you know there are people walking around around I can't uh, hear you sweetheart huh yeah two human figures below Bawa that's right yeah this is uh during their travels in India with Baba. This is Benares, which is of course a holy place. Here they are with Baba all again, dressed up in saris and Elizabeth is the one you can see clearly on the uh, our far right, sitting on the ground. Mara looking at Baba. Charles, um, on the picture of, of um, Elizabeth's coat. Yes. Um, for well over 20 years at Maribod in the museum was both um, a coat of Elizabeth's that Baba had worn and a picture of him wearing it at Benares. Um, it, it was sort of um, black and white speckled in the weaving of it. Um, and I'm wondering, could there have been two heavy coats like that? This looks rather similar to it, although you know it's hard to see the texture um, that the actual coat had. And in that photograph, you could sort of see the black and white specks but um, is there any possibility that it could be another coat that's buried at, at Myrtle Beach? Because, you know, I gave the tour every week of, of historic Maribod that included going to the museum and that coat in, in my years was always there um, as part of the display. Well, you know, they just made things up. I'm just kidding. I'm just. Oh, no, of course they didn't. I'm just. Stop. I'm just. I'm just teasing. Uh, I mean, I, all I know, I don't know. Uh, so the my the, the simple answer is I have no idea about the number of coats and so forth. The, I mean, that Elizabeth might have, Baba might have worn of hers. The the my uh, only knowledge is that Elizabeth, when the you know before the time came, she uh identified the coat that, that she said Baba wore of hers is as the item that she wanted to be buried at the center. That's all I know. And honestly, uh, if there was an, there must have been another one, uh, because if they have another on display, so that's all uh, <laughs> I don't know. And I was always told, and I think Elizabeth said this as well to, to, to us and to mother, that this picture, which she took, uh, uh, was of, of that coat. So that's all I know. <laughs> there might've been more than one, so. <laughs> yeah, maybe there were two. There must've been, right? Now, now we're talking about it, there must've been. <laughs> It's again, Elizabeth's not in this picture, but Nadine is, Nadine Tolstoy, with her hands over her ears. This is a beautiful picture. Yes. It's more of a kind of tweedy pattern. It's different than this coat. That's the, definitely the coat that was Elizabeth's. Right, but the, 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 the coat, this is, the, I think, the same coat we just saw in the picture, but. So this, this, uh, this photo is another photo of Baba wearing coat. And I, unless I'm going crazy, it's the same. Oops. And it's the one that I remember from the Maribod Museum. Yeah, well, this is the one Baba, I mean, Elizabeth uh, uh, 
Elizabeth gave this photograph to my mother, identifying it as the coat that Baba wore and that is buried at the center. So. Well, she didn't know it was buried at the center. Huh? She didn't know it was buried. No, no, she didn't know at the time. Who? Elizabeth, but it's definitely the one. Well, she, had, she, yeah, she identified it later as the one that she wanted to, to have at the center, right? That's all we know. That's our family lore. Um, so I'm going to close now because I know you. I wanted to at least have one shot of Elizabeth and Norena at the center <clears throat> uh, at the end. And, uh, and of course, Elizabeth at the center. Could we go back a couple and see the one of Kippy? Oh, yes, Baba, Baba oh, with Kippy. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful. Thank you. They both look like they're in ecstasy. <laughs> yeah, Kippy was a, was a big favorite. That's um, Kippy and um, one, of the, one of the bunnies in in uh, in the zoo there, I believe Elizabeth took this picture here. Um, I know she did. She took this picture. So it's, I think it's one of the most beautiful photographs of Baba. She had a really good eye, you know. There she is, in front of the lagoon cabin, of course. We're back to where we started. So there's one little teeny poem that she wrote uh, and put her initials under that I'll end with. It's just four little lines. My love for you rises like incense before the altar of my life. My love for you rises like incense before the altar of my life. So I, Baba at the center. There's another of the ecstatic pictures of Baba with Kippy. <laughs> That's great too, Baba's expression. <laughs> Kippy's expression. <laughs> Uh -huh. there, Kippy seems to be in heaven there. Charles, can you please repeat the first quote? I like that in the silence of your perfect. Yes, circle. absolutely. Yeah. That is a, so beautiful. Beautiful, record. yeah. Let's, let's go back and do that. Yes. <clears throat> in the silence of your perfect surrender, my love for you, which is always silent, can flow to you to be yours to keep and to share with those who seek me. This is when they returned to India in the late 40s. Narina had been very ill, and, uh, but she managed, she rallied enough uh, to travel to India and they were at Meherazad for, for a period. Okay, Charles, one last time, please, that quote. I, I'm writing fast, but... Okay. In the silence of your perfect surrender, my love for you, which is always silent, can flow to you to be yours always, to keep and to share with those who seek me. That's a very wonderful, from, well, what it, of course, that's an understatement. What I particularly love about that is, is the reminder that for myself, I often think, yeah, I would like to send love to people. I would like to show them Baba's love, his grace, send it. But then I can't. 
you know, I don't have the capacity. But then I remember, but Baba has the capacity in me. And so I can send his love and his grace, you know, in prayer and meditation in thought, uh, I can do that. And this quote is a reminder that however limited we are, or however our love is limited, or, you know, un uncertain, uh, that when we receive his love, it's there for us to share with others. It's his. He gives us the blessing of being able to share it, but it comes from him. Charles, I really appreciated her letters to her parents. Oh, aren't they wonderful? Yeah. yeah. They are wonderful. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank you for sharing them. Wow. Yeah. So profound. So profound. Yeah. We could segue into a whole thing on Kippy if we wanted to, <laughs> but we won't. <laughs> you know, there's Kippy on her on her birthday. <laughs> Did Elizabeth have a brother or sister or was she only yes. child? She oh. had a brother uh, who died fairly young, Simeon, uh. Simeon June Jr. She had um, a sister who, Marietta, who died fairly young as well. And she had a sister, Virginia, uh, who was Daphne's mother. And Virginia lived to be quite an uh, older age um, uh, and moved in the end to Myrtle Beach. So she was living there in a condo in Myrtle Beach with Daphne and her husband, Burton. Um, uh -huh. Some of you probably remember them. So she, um, you know, she didn't, none of her siblings, and of course, uh, Virginia was the only one who lived long enough to be part of Elizabeth's life through her work for Baba and the center and all that. But um, Elizabeth, I mean, Virginia knew Baba, met Baba, um, as did her nephew, Harry, um, who was Marietta's son. Mm -hmm. So she had, a, she had family members, various Chapins, you know, scattered yeah. around. And, um, uh, but uh, yeah, she, so she, yes, she did. She had she had siblings. Yeah. Might be a nice one to close with. This is, uh, I think, one of the most beautiful uh, pictures. Now, this one um, was taken by Dr. Gohair because. Um, Dana Ferry was in India at the time. And Dana wanted to take a picture of Elizabeth and Mara, but time was up and she was leaving and everyone was required to leave. And so she gave the camera to Dr. Gohair and asked if she could take a, pic a photo for her. So this is a photo taken by Dr. Gohair using Dana Ferry's camera. <laughs> and what a gift, because uh, I mean, for me anyway, this is one of the most characteristic expressions of Elizabeth. This is just, and, and the happiness in her face, the joy, you know, of being with Mara, who she loved so much and you know, respected so much and vice versa. Mara had tremendous, tremendous respect for Elizabeth. And it gave Mara such joy when Elizabeth would come to visit and Kitty. So this picture captures, captures their relationship. <laughs> so uh, Ruthie. Yeah, I hear the dogs are home. Yeah, so we do. Are there any, anything else you want to accomplish this morning? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't look at chat. So there may be people had things they wanted to ask, but I, I can't. I don't have my. Um... Um, I don't know that there's a lot of questions here. 
<clears throat> excuse me, but I just have to also say how wonderful. I can't wait to replay this. I, I don't ever go back and re-listen to anything, but I will be re-listening to this because those letters were just so deep and profound. Thank you, Charles. What a wonderful way to celebrate. You're welcome. And oh, what, what, uh, I want to make my screen bigger again, but I'm afraid of losing everything. <laughs> yes, he wants me to show something, but I have to make the, so I have the screen little, but if I do anything weird. You mean stop sharing? Stop sharing. <laughs> you have a screen share. Uh, new, new share. Uh, maybe if you just hit on that little thing, it'll, it'll stop share right here. There we uh -huh. go. Ah, aha, there you all are. <laughs> oh, Dana's here. She heard me tell her story. Yeah, that's the thing. Wayne is here. I, yeah, I, Wayne's I, here. Wayne is here. And I mentioned earlier that he'd given me that quote for my birthday, which is so sweet. And um, gosh, I, I missed a lot by not knowing who's here. No, this. <laughs> Christopher likes to share uh, things. So good. Oh, nice. Everybody's bringing their faces up now, Charles. This is great. Show so, yourselves. Yes, yeah, show yourselves. So, Charles, Charles, this is Judy. And I, I want to thank Judy. you so much for your, your sharing today. It was so heartful. One thank last you. question about um, Elizabeth's coat being buried at, at Myrtle Beach. Yes. Do you know what year, or Christopher may know, what year that was interred? It probably not 1980 when she actually passed. Um, could it be as as late as the 90s? Mm -hmm. Like maybe maybe they actually went to Maribod mm -hmm. and someone brought it back to be interred there. Very that possible. That's a good point. Yeah. I don't remember. That's what I'm thinking. That don't it, remember. It left the museum by yeah. or before the 2000s, I think. Um, you know, it was no longer being shown. So maybe, you know, someone literally brought it back and it is the one coat, because um, that is the coat that was in the museum. Um. And my hunch is that um, they followed through on that wish of hers that that would be the yeah. coat um and it said goodbye to maribod yeah, um, it, it would have been during mother's lifetime but uh she died in 97 but i so but i don't know exactly when maybe she i remember when she came in 95 could and, be and could monty be. literally right. rolled out the carpet for her visit mm -hmm. perhaps when she returned to myrtle beach in 95 she would have been the one they would have entrusted. They wouldn't give something like Elizabeth's coat to just anybody. No. <laughs> that would be the perfect hands to put it in, to take it there. So well, it, it could be exhumed. They exhume things that they want to find out for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We don't need to. We don't also, need to. As long as you all are hanging in, those who want yeah. to, I'll show you. This is this was a little um pocket watch that belonged to Elizabeth. She loved little things. And so she had a lot of little sweet little things. And this this was her pocket watch and it was, yeah, her, Krista reminds me, her aunt gave it to her when she was 14. And on the back it says ECM, which would have been Elizabeth Maddox Chapin, Maddox being her mother's maiden name. So this very sweet, she loved that. And then she wrote, she drove an ambulance, as you know, during World War I in New York. And this was her badge of service, right? Yeah. It says on it, uh, American Red Cross. <laughs> so that, With big service at the top there. Yeah. <laughs> so she loved, as you know, to drive. So it's not surprising then. And, Speaking of driving during the blue bus tours and all of that, she wore this watch in India, very simple watch. 
and so this watch went with her, um, you know, and she, it was very important because of, uh, you know, time. Baba was very particular about time. So she had to know the time as the driver. Um, not in the morning when they woke her up. She always told Kitty when Kitty woke her up in Del Ruba, early morning, Kitty would bring her her, her coffee, you know, and toast or whatever. And, um, and if she had to go on a trip, she might have to get up at like five in the morning. And she said to Kitty, she said, you know, I don't mind what time I have to get up as long as you don't tell me what time it is. <laughs> so, so she didn't want to know what time, but this, uh, oh yes. So this uh, watch, she wore all her time in India in the blue bus tours. And then she gave it to Mani when she came back to the United States in 1941. And then Mani wore it through all the years with Baba. I mean, it's amazing how this watch kept going. Mani, Mani told me, she said, you know, this thing, it, it's, it's old, but she said, I, you know, I had it with Baba at Guru Prasad and, you know, and she said all the way till the end. And then she told me after Baba dropped the body, it no longer worked. And she gave it to me at that time. Oh. So this is, yes, this is hair and nails given to Elizabeth by Korshed's mother, Masi. <clears throat> So it must be quite early here. It's auburn. auburn color, yes. You can't quite tell if you, you know, on the zoom, but it's it's very auburn colored. And um, then what we you had the little animals, the miniatures. Oh, <clears throat> so she collected miniatures over the years of animals, you know, she loved animals so much. And uh, you know, two dogs. She loved these, these things, these miniatures. Here's a parrot. We have a parrot and we have two dogs. Um, and Wendy has been very sweet to give these to Christopher kind of one by one. She's doled them out <laughs> over the years, you know, how it is you run out of things to give one another after so many years um so you <laughs> you have to dole them out a little at a time and now and now we we've run out we might have to start all over again like they did at the ashram you know you have to dig in your trunk and give something somebody gave to you back to them but anyway so we're getting to that point in our in our old age these miniatures might have to go back to when <laughs> Charles, hopefully what, she'll what remember. Happened to, what, what happened to Jimmy? Did did the, was Jimmy the turtle? Was did did he die after Elizabeth died or before? Yes, no. So Jimmy is named Jimmy because the lawn man, the man mowing our lawn in in Durham, Hope Valley, when I was growing up, found him rather than run over oh. him with the lawn. Oh. So I thought in the honor of this man Jimmy finding the turtle. Uh, I named him Jimmy. Uh, I had at the time an invisible companion that was a turtle. And so strangely enough, this turtle materialized and became the real turtle. I mean, a <laughs> real turtle Jimmy. other people could see. And my mother always was very sweet about my invisible companion as children, you know, had them. But uh, so she always acknowledged my turtle companion. But then, of course, I got a real one. And then we moved to Myrtle Beach, you know, and met Bob and so forth. And Jimmy, of course, came with us. And, um, and he came, lived at Happy House. And, uh, and, and uh, one day, Elizabeth came to see us, to see me at Happy House. And this was when it was in Myrtle Beach, of course. <clears throat> and Elizabeth had moved this house from somewhere else. It was this 
old house. She moved down the highway, plopped it on in, in the 30s in Myrtle Beach, and then later it was moved again on a truck to the center. Anyway, she, we were living there, <clears throat> and Elizabeth came and said she just wanted to see me by myself, which was quite unusual. At the time, we were, we were planning to move to New York for Mother's acting career. And uh, she came and sat on the porch and she said, now I have something very important to ask you. And I said, what's that, Annie Boo? She said, well, do you think that, how do you think a turtle would like living in New York City? Would that be a good place for a turtle? And I had not thought about it. And I said, you know, because you see, she said, you, you couldn't take him outside. You know, I would take him out in the, in the pine straw and stuff, you know. <clears throat> and I, I thought about it and I said, well, I, I, I guess that would be, be difficult, Annie Boo. And she said, yes, you see, that's just it. It would be very, very difficult for the turtle, for Jimmy. So she said, you know, what we can do, and this was her plan all along, <laughs> what we can do is Jimmy can come live with me yes. while you're in New York. <laughs> then you see, when you come home, he'll be so excited to see you. Yeah. Uh -huh. And when you come home, he'll stick his neck way out to see you. Uh -huh. <laughs> and of course I was, both really kind of um, upset and yet happy at the same time. I mean, for me, Elizabeth was my lodestar, everything. And so of course the very idea that Jimmy would be with her was kind of the next best thing for me being with her. So I, um, of course I said, yes, Annie Boo, that, that sounds like a good plan. And so that's how Jimmy came to live with Elizabeth. And, uh, and then there are many stories that I won't tell now of her caring for Jimmy, even when she, you know, could have a hard time walking and she still went up those stairs to one at a time slowly to care for Jimmy, to put him in his bath, to give him his shower, you know, pour the water over him. And, um, and sometimes <laughs> we would have people there, you know, visiting in the living room and she would have her hand closed like this. And I knew what it was. It was the hamburger for Jimmy that she would get out of the refrigerator, but she never liked to give it to him too cold. So she would warm it up in her, in her fist. And then when it was the right temperature, she would go and take it to him. And I, so Elizabeth, I knew that that's what she had in her hand. I mean, it, nobody else did, but I could, I knew. And at a certain point in the conversation, no matter what, where we were in the conversation, Elizabeth would, would rise from her chair and say, I'll, I'll, you'll have to excuse me for a moment, I'll be right back. And she would go and take the hamburger up those stairs because the temperature had gotten just right and give it to Jimmy. And so anyway, there are many, many moments like that of her and Jimmy. And, Jimmy loved Evelina, you know, in the kitchen, he would be under her feet and she would be so careful, you know, but he loved being there. He loved Kitty, but he loved Elizabeth the most. And uh, he sat next to her on the table at Del Ruba often in the last years. And he, she would feed him, you know, from her bowl. Sometimes she'd feed him cottage cheese or his favorite, which would be ice cream. He loved ice cream. So Jimmy had a pretty nice life and that would have been like 27 years by that time or something like that, but since, since Jimmy found him in the yard in, in Durham. And, but when Elizabeth went to Baba, he stopped, began to not want to eat. Hey, Charles. So he, 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 he just stopped at some point and, and he died. And we buried him 
near Elizabeth's coat. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and my, my dog, Buff, and Beauty, they're all buried there. Ah. That's a secret, nobody knows. But I didn't know that. They are buried there. Don't tell people. Well, I, I'll try not to, but I always stop there. It's just like, it's like, you know, oh, well, how do they get to bury people? Things, about living beings at the center. We don't. So you know how people yeah. are. Think. But Elizabeth was Elizabeth, and we snuck it all in under the wire. And um, now, of course, we can't do such things anymore. But, um, but anyway, the turtle is near her. Charles, I don't want to yes. hold you too long. I know that you're... Um recuperating and you might need to be <laughs> wrapping up this <laughs> yeah well christopher keeps giving me stuff i'll give you one more and then we can um oh cool oh yeah one more thing one more artifact that's not it, it's kind of more about elizabeth and my mother and um charles and just a word on on uh jimmy he's like he's like Mustan. To Baba, yes. you know, Mustan stopped eating when Baba passed away, and it was such a heartache for Mara that he wouldn't eat, and he also just passed with his beloved, and so that was the way with Jimmy and Elizabeth. Yes, exactly right, yeah. So... Um... I mentioned about Elizabeth in the beginning, loving poetry so much, and I've shared with you a couple of her poems that she wrote. <clears throat> this is a poem um, that she did not write, but had memory. Charles, some, for some reason you're muted. Yeah. That's because I'm screaming at Christopher. Oh, okay. Jesse Rittenhouse. Boy, I tell you, if it weren't for Christopher, I wouldn't know anything. Um, so one year early, we met Elizabeth uh, and Kitty uh, a year before Baba came in 19, June of 1957, as you know, just after Norena died. I mean, the same week of her funeral. Um, and Baba came a year later in May. So this was something given to my mother. It wasn't framed or anything, but just a piece of paper um, uh, just before Baba came. So this is dated April 21st, 1958. April 21st happens to be Christopher and my anniversary of, of coming together uh, 33 years ago too, well, the, the date, April 21st. But April 21st, 1958, so this would be just a month before Baba came. And, um, and she gave uh, Jane this poem uh, that she memorized. So this is from memory and she wrote it down. <clears throat> and it's in my view, both to Baba and to Jane at the same time. That's, but you can take it however you want. My debt to you beloved, is one I cannot pay in any coin, in any realm, on any reckoning day. For where is she to measure the debt when all is said to her who makes your dream again, you dream again when all your dreams are dead? That's Elizabeth's handwriting. So, you know, mother brought this whole life to Elizabeth after Norena. So I think it reflects that. Well, I think we've run out of artifacts. <laughs> no, we haven't actually. We, I bet not. I we'll, we'll, call, we'll call it a day on the artifact show and tell, but it's fun to share. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt that. I just they'll, no, they'll all be at the center, you know, for people to enjoy someday. So um, we're just temporarily taking care, and uh, 
or Christopher's taking care, you know, he, <laughs> everything's in archival boxes and, you oh, know, cool. uh, yeah. very, very carefully done. Uh, and and, and un unlike what I might do <laughs> if it were left, left to me. Um, we'll say thank you, Christopher. Yes. Yeah. Uh, someone has their hand. That's Betty. Betty. Uh -huh. Will we see any of these beautiful letters printed? Um, yes. Oh, my. Well, it's not in my wheelhouse, but uh, in the sense that they're all, the collection is all <clears throat> with Wendy and Buzz. They have asked Christopher and I to help with the collection and getting them out. <clears throat> and so my, I'll just be transparent about it. My advice to them, rather than just be so overwhelmed at the volume of material, you know, uh, that there is, um, one early volume could be letters. And it could just be a particular periods, you know, different volumes could be different periods. She was a prolific letter writer. And so that's what I'm, I'm gonna encourage them. We haven't had this conversation as to what comes first. Um, given Wendy's health and Buzz's, you know, being so busy, you know, we haven't talked in a while, um, but I think I'm free to say these things because, uh, you know, Wendy and Buzz asked Christopher and I if we could help because we have been focused on Norena's papers and Nadine's papers and, Hopefully we'll be finished with Nadine's, all of that and publishing that soon. So we might have this opportunity. It's a little awkward being here. I can't help as much with the helping Wendy curate what she'd like to see published, but writing a whole you know, biography, which I think Wendy would love to do, might be you know, beyond the scope of what can be done in the immediate future. But I think publishing volumes of the letters, they, they're so powerful in and of themselves. And plus all of her photographs, you know, many have not been published. And um, so there's a lot that could just go out. I mean, everything would have to be worked on, but you know, it's not like um, it could be done. So I hope so, it's a long way of saying, I hope that uh, they can be made available. Maybe sure. an easier way would be to, to excerpts in the Glow magazine or something, so that now yeah, that's a that's a possibility, like and uh, you know, um, so yeah, I'll see see uh, what what Wendy has in mind, but that's all that's all her and Buzz. Uh, it's up to them, however they want to do. You know, we have a similar kind of challenge. We have all these thought transmission scrapbooks. I mean, just endless. But I have to say that the letters are much more compelling <laughs> because, you know, those thought transmissions are dated and they're in a certain reaction to certain things. The letters are timeless. Many of the letters are timeless. And they are such wisdom, as you heard, about life with Baba. They're also immediate, though, which I love these letters because it's she's writing as she is experiencing training with Baba. And uh, she's writing what that's like. So uh, yes, I think people would enjoy having that. Yeah. And I think Dylan had something. I don't know if she's still. Um... Hi, hi, Charles. We love you, Charles. Thank oh, hi. You. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know that you. Ruthie only calls me Dylan now because of you? Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so here's my important, very intimate question, because the turtle story just slayed us. I didn't know turtles had affection for human beings, but how big was this turtle? Uh, he was about so big. Uh, can you see? About yeah. so big. He started out so big, but they don't grow too big. He's a box turtle, was a box turtle. He was like this. And that was about it. So pretty good size. I don't think box turtles live as long as he did in the wild. Um, and honestly, I don't think any of us quite knew the best care. There were, you know, there are vets now who specialize in exotic animals. Here in Washington area, we have them. I don't think there was any such thing in Myrtle Beach. So he might have even lived. Well, I think after Elizabeth, he would not have lived longer. But I think. He had a problem with losing part of his lower jaw 
um, you know, as he got older and so he could only eat soft things. So there were issues, but um, this is a funny story that I don't think I've ever told before, but um, funny, sweet story about the, the Jimmy. Not long after we got to Myrtle Beach, we lived in this place called Whitney House on the ocean, rented for us by Elizabeth for the winter because we had no place to live. My mother had just left, you know, her home and we had, we really didn't have anything. And Elizabeth put us up in this beautiful home. It's probably still there and it's right on the beach, a spectacular place. And I had uh, Jimmy and um, I don't think at that time, mother wanted Jimmy in the house. Don't, don't know. This is very early, but anyway, so Jimmy was in the garage and I would go out and I had a big place box for him and everything. Somehow, I do not know how it happened. A dog got hold of Jimmy. And I don't remember how this happened. And puncture broke a little piece of it, a, a piece of his shell on his side. And of course, when I went out and found this, I didn't see it. I just assumed it was a local dog or something. After this, Jimmy was always inside, by the way. Uh, but um, I didn't know what to do because again, I, you know, we just didn't think about vets and turtles. Um, maybe we should have, but we didn't. And I didn't know what to do, and but I was in a deep state of shock because to me, this would be the end of Jimmy. If he lost that big piece of his shell off the side, then he would die. That was how I took it. So in my, I was what, seven years old, I guess, or something like that. Yeah, no, yeah, seven years old, must have been. And I, in the shock of the moment, I put the piece back in to where it was. And this is the, the amazing part. I had just learned to Baba, I hadn't met Baba yet, but I'd learned to Baba uh, through Elizabeth and Kitty. So I knew Baba enough to say a prayer. And so I put the shell back in its place, like a puzzle piece. And I prayed to Baba that um, he heal Jimmy. And you know something at looking back, this is not, I mean, I, I've never asked Baba for anything in prayer. I mean, I just, that's just not how I pray. Even as a child, that's just not, you know, I mean, your will be done was my prayer, but this was the first, my first prayer and my last prayer petition to Baba. So I put the, the piece back in, I held it there and sat with him for a long time. And then when I took my hand off, it stayed. And he was healed. Now, maybe turtles get healed naturally. I don't know. But for me, it was just, it, it was not a miracle. It was just, well, Baba, Baba did it for me. You know, it was that simple. And Jimmy went on to live, what, 25 or whatever more years. <laughs> so anyway, he was quite, he was quite a character. And you know what? He would, when I came home, he would stick his neck out far. <laughs> when I come and say hello to him, he'd stick his neck out way far. So, yeah. Elizabeth, Annie Boo always insisted that it was because he recognized me. I, I have no idea, but I, that's how I took it. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, you know, life with Baba. So wonderful, you know.
why don't we have a moment of silence together? And then if anybody wants, to, I'm sure people want to thank you, but maybe just a moment of silence would be really nice. Hey, Baba. And thank you all for being here. And thank you for very sweet messages too in the chat. You know, I never get a chance to look until towards the end. And now I, um, I see all, all my dear friends sending loving messages. It's so sweet. Thank you. <clears throat> We'll send them to you, Charles. Thank you. Well, you know, yeah. the older you get, the more these things mean. You know what I'm saying? I kind of do, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Charles, yes. I'm Gail, um, and this is Kippy. And can you see Kippy here? Oh, Kippy, yes, I see Kippy. <laughs> and I want to say that I grew up in Durham, Hope Valley, and oh. my grandparents lived on Club Boulevard. Did your grandparents, or did your mom grow up there? Yes, they lived in Hope Valley on Exeter Way. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure in relation. Club Boulevard, I think, was very close to that. Wow. Club Boulevard was towards Watts Hospital. So that's where my mother grew up. But I grew up in Durham, Hope Valley. So we have some commonalities. Oh, you, you, grew up in, you, you grew up in Hope Valley. Oh, yeah. Yes, wow. yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yes, we do. We do. <laughs> But everybody else talked to. I just was That's saying. That's wonderful. Very, That's very sweet. I I love that. <laughs> Kippy. Yeah, we love Kippy. <laughs> Charles, that was just so wonderful. Again, I'm so grateful that you decided to come along and. Oh well, you share this time. you invite me. I it's hard to say no to you. Yeah. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Also, anything to do with Elizabeth. Yeah. Yeah. It just. Uh, anything to do with elizabeth gives me such joy you know and just sharing her you know, Did you unmute? is is so special yeah it's a great gift yeah. yes it is yeah and charles um it's judy thank you so much the insight from the letters was so touching of uh, the the hardships the love all wrapped together those years in in india that she was writing to her parents um such a beautiful beautiful way to to share her with all of us today and all of the animals she you know you know better than i was isn't it said that that elizabeth maybe loved animals more than human beings and um so that we've spent so much time with with uh, jimmy and kippy and and others um seems very fitting for for a remembrance of elizabeth well, she, we always used to joke that uh, being a being an animal or being a dog especially or a cat over at del Ruba was much preferable to being a human being over at Del Ruba. <laughs> we, we had our challenges over there, you know, it was a madhouse, but the, the animals were always treated with very special care. Rick, there you are. You know, it's so funny. I was just talking about you yesterday with Bob Aarons, and he was, we were asking each other about you and, um, uh, and here you are. I said, well, no, I haven't seen Rick in a while. But here he is. Your wish is my command. Yeah, you look so wonderful. You, well, you so do too. Wonderful. Great to see you. <laughs> Great to see you too. So sweet. So sweet to see you, really. <laughs> yeah. You guys are doing well? Yeah. Good. Surviving. Good. And you are you in Paris or Atlanta? No, we're leaving next in, in about uh, four weeks to go back for a couple of months. But we're in Atlanta now renovating our kitchen 
Oh, so wow. we're in the midst of total chaos. <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, if you can still do, you know, I mean, it's like, that's good, good for you. I wish we had the energy, but this whole pandemic has just kept everything from being renovated. So good for you. Can you come up here and do ours? <laughs> if I survive this one. <laughs> no, it's Mark. wonderful. I, well, give my love to Jim. It's so nice to see you. Really lovely to see you. Yeah. You too. You too. Much love to you and Christopher. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's so sweet. <laughs> Yesterday, I was just thinking, you know, wow. I, when Bob was asking me about Rick, I said, well, I don't know. I think he might be in Atlanta, but you know, it's in other words, it's been a long time. And there you, and then today you pop up. Up pop the devil. Like a bad penny. <laughs> <laughs> you turn up. <laughs> oh my. So nice. Well, so nice to see everybody. You know, yeah. And well, thanks. For, thank you for doing this. Oh, it was such a joy. It was a joy. Hey, Charles, one one last question. Can you maybe do a Zoom? That was all about your artifacts. Oh, it seems a little. Who's asking me this? Diane. Oh, Diane. Well, if you ask, then maybe I will. But I, the reason <laughs> I say that is because, and Christopher did this today. I, I kind of sometimes feel it's a little embarrassing or self-serving, you know, because it's, you know, it's like, oh, I have this, and I, you know, look at this, you know. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> always felt a little embarrassed about it, but of course, I've been you know, 60 plus years around these folks. And so naturally it, they, they have to have a home. And so, so I, so I shouldn't be so uh, reticent about it, but I have been, I'm reticent about it. They're just it renting, is, they're just renting from you. And if yeah, we, that's right, it is gonna... fun. It is fun to share. And um, in fact, Judy asked, uh, you know, uh, at some point to share the, and I think I did share with her the, the garland Baba gave to Pindu when he finished the tomb <clears throat> and things like that. So they're really some amazing little things. I mean, Rick and I could do it together because Rick would probably have hours of things to share. I mean, the Mondley were so, uh, it gave him so many wonderful things. So yes, there are some beautiful things to share, well, but- um, You walked right into it. So what do you we'll, think, Rick? We'll do it, Rick. Can, uh, I, I think um, some sort of international registry of Baba artifacts wouldn't be a bad idea because right. this weighs on me. I do have some incredible things that Gohair gave me and that uh, Mara gave me and Mani, and um, they're in a safe place. But if I died, my terror is that somebody might overlook it and think, well, what, what are these archival boxes? Let's just yeah. send them off to Goodwill. <laughs> don't say that <laughs> well i yeah, i'm sure that's not true knowing you they'll be taken care of but it is a it is an important question and the center is uh bl planning now to build facility to hold a lot more and not just things related to the center but things other things and so it's a new policy it's a new understanding and and of course there are other places in Asheville there they have a, a an archives and then Narshawan mm -hmm. has an archives but Narshawan's going to be passing his on so it the question of when and how to put it somewhere safely is a is, we we have the same thing so we're we're trying now to make sure that everything is labeled and everything is you know and and the whoever it is that's in charge that we designate if we both should baba should both take us at the same time knows exactly what's what not because these things are somehow you know like medieval red relics but but they do carry such a history and a meaning and uh and baba can work through them you know there's uh, just something that went on the blue bus tour Something as as simple as that is a for many people in the future will be such a blessing that you know to have a physical piece of that uh, time. So yeah, so it's uh, it's there are people who have passed away, and you know that uh, where their stuff goes, we do not know. <laughs> so <laughs> and whatever happens at the center with the archives will be 
you know, always so much indebted to what Dot Lesnick accomplished, you know, over all those years, the meticulousness and the, the research that she put into that, just the, the one pointedness, which Rick well knows because of the restoration of the, um, the tomb. So she really laid the foundation for what's going to happen later. She's the gold standard, really. She, you know, everything was done per so well. And uh, both in India and in, in, in America, she had such an important role. But the center, she was the, the archivist and, um, and did a lot of wonderful work. So, and as yeah. you say, she was also very instrumental in setting up the archives at Maribod and Marazad. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and at Baba House in, in Pune and yeah. so forth. And to the original um, request from Diane, about a Zoom relic meeting. Charles, my sense is when you share anything that you've been blessed to have in your possession for the moment, it's nothing to do with, with self-serving to you. It's, <laughs> it's serving all of us who just literally. Yeah, I hope so. Hey. It's taken, it takes away, <laughs> getting out of the way is the hardest part of life with Bob. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yes, and of course, they all have stories connected with them about Baba, which is different than, you know, that's a different thing. And they, they provoke. So yeah, that's quite right. It's, uh, and to share them is a gift to all of us. That's what that, I mean. That's, that's where you come in, Charles. Yeah. That's, yes, you're your story. I, I second what wow. Judy said about uh, not being self-serving, because when you uh, showed us all these pieces and told the stories connected with it, it, uh, it's not just looking at the watch, you know, that was in from this year to this year in possession of this one or that one, but it's actually living. It's a living memory when you tell it. So that's why Zoom can be even more interesting than just going through an archive and looking at the things and reading some notes on it. Because um, this watch, it, it reminded me of the, um, of the gong, of Baba's gong that went out when, uh, when Baba passed away and this watch went out the same way. Mm -hmm. So there's correlation between the dog going, um, dying and you, your turtle dying and the gong going and the, and the watch going, you know? So it's, and yeah. always yeah. when you talk, um, Charles, there's so much uh, sharing of love and well, it's so you. much reaches from heart to heart, so. It never fails. It's no. just so beautiful and so precious. And her letters to her parents, <gasps> wow. Wow, because when we think about our parents and how we would have explained uh, how we would have explained our journey to them if we could or could not, you know, and how she is talking to them, uh, knowing that it is her parents, not, not just someone who's interested in spirituality. And what she said about her father and what she learned from her father, from his uh, em em emulating his journey, his uh, way. Wow. Yeah. And the way she writes is so fluent and so beautiful yes. that so wow. Yeah. So thank you for this thinking that this is what you want to bring today. Yes. And thank you for being <laughs> so kind of you. That's a kind thing to say. And uh, yeah, I it hit me, you know, well, I've, I've written down stories about Elizabeth, but why not hear from Elizabeth? <laughs> uh -huh. But there's so then I thought, well, how can we do that? And I said, well, there are these letters that Kitty gathered. So yeah, so it was, it was, it was a, joy. And, a joy. And thanks to Christopher also for doing yeah. all these archi archiving and <laughs> assisting in this you know being the background but we're feeling yeah. here with us yeah. and i did read your books um um it's very touching um let the day be the answer yeah and very beautiful yeah. and she's inspiring me i mean elizabeth is really really inspiring um for me just oh, being um keeping in the background and not in the front line and being such a huge huge lady in baba's love uh, she was uh, something very amazing, and I'm very moved by her, though I never met her. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's so beautiful. 
All right. Well, I don't want to wear you out, but you know, I think they've already set up the next Zoom, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rick well, will be in touch. <laughs> as long as the co-curator, Christopher Wilson, will be available. Oh my God. Christopher's like, yeah, Christopher. Oh yeah, he knows where everything is. I mean, it's unbelievable. Things I didn't even know we had, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah. And we we also like to collect over the years, we haven't in a long time, but we went through a period uh, where we collected relics from centuries ago. So we actually love relics. Uh, and they're not relics to us. They are living, they're living experiences. You know, they are. Yeah, they are. Well, I'm envious for the little animals. Christopher, I, I really like those. those I love those so much. Those are some of my very favorite things. Yeah. <laughs> and Charles, when you bring out all the various little treasures that you have, I'm reminded of Monty on Tuesdays at Marathon. And <laughs> Monty would bring out from her drawers and, and so forth, you know, these a bunny rabbit that she she and Mara had sewed from Baba's hair and his fingernails and other kinds of very sweet and pass it around to everybody sitting on the floor and in, in Mondeley Hall. Yes. And it had nothing to do with self-serving. It was like giving to us and linking each of our hearts to the love that was put into those objects that Baba received from the women Mondali that offered them to him. It, it's it's like a give and take of love. And that's what we've been doing all morning. And yes. thank you so much for- Well, thank you. I you feel, I feel very uh, energized and full of love being with all of you today. And uh, oh my gosh, seeing so many dear ones like Rick and, all of you, Wayne, and oh my gosh, it's just so wonderful, Betty, and hey, Candy, up there. <laughs> it's like Hollywood Squares. <laughs> it's great. It really is. Yeah. Marvin. Diane, better known as Dylan and Terry. <laughs> and the Smiths, there's Gerald, really? Susan. Are they, are they here? Where are they? Yeah, they're right they're down in there that hallway. Oh right my there. gosh. There you are. There you are. It's a little dim in your room, but I now I see you. I, I see like you. Kippy the best. I like Kippy better than all these people. Yeah, I know. I, I'm Kippy. in my uh COVID clothes hit. right now. Yeah. She's yeah. just getting out of the floor. It's wonderful to hear you, Charles. Yeah, really. thank, thank you so you. much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, everybody for letting us know. Jay Baba. Jay Baba, Baba. Hey, good to see Christopher, too. Jay Baba. Bye. 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 Jay Baba. Jay Baba, Charles. Jay Baba, thank you so much, Charles. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. He's gone. What a wonderful time that was.